Sean Rash, how you doing, man? Morning, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? Just uh, enjoying a beautiful morning and getting ready to finish up some small t- touches with the uh, event coming up this weekend. Are you ready? No, not even close. I think the bowling center is. I'm not. Why? Oh, just uh, you know, it's one of those things. I just want to make sure everything's right. I can't. Uh, I can't let other people do it, which I should, because then I can just let me practice, but, um, it'll be fine. Everything's pretty much ready to go. Do you, uh, do you think running a tournament, um, and bowling in it in the same time, have you caught flack for that at all? Oh yeah. Last year I, I was fine on Saturday, but then I ran out of gas during the finals, um, on Sunday and, or 18 months ago now, but uh, people were like, if you were just focused, you might have won your own event. I said, well, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, so you're running an event this weekend, and that's kind of why I wanted to like, get together and talk about it. But I do want to talk about that, but I want to talk about that a little bit later. Since I have you, I want to dig a little deep because you've had a, uh, you've had a, a quite the, the cool career, and I've got some questions about it. So, if you don't mind. No, nah, not at all. So I was doing some research on the PBA website yesterday, and I typed in your name, and it, I brought up the the stat page. And when we when I was scrolling down, I saw total career earnings, one point two something million dollars. Dude, you've made a million dollars throwing a bowling ball. How does that feel? Well, it's pretty surreal when you talk about uh, how much money you've made in the sport that has been so good to me. Um, and that's before like all the, the bonuses and the contracts and uh, overseas money and everything else. So just extremely uh, thankful and blessed and uh, God willing to uh, to be able to play this game at a high level for so many years so far. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to double that or even triple that number before my career is over. But uh just like I said, it, it's been a fun ride so far for 12, 13 years on tour now, and uh, looking forward to many more in the future. Did you did you expect that to happen when you were younger, like, say, like youth, college? Did you think you were going to be this successful? You know, honestly, as a youth uh, bowler growing up in the state of Alaska, I didn't think I would ever be a professional bowler. My first love was baseball, um, and I was just, you know, funny you bring it up, talking to Dad the other day in the yard. Uh, through the weekend, we had a couple birthday parties and graduation parties and a, a baby sprinkling for our, our second one on the way, um, throwing the ball around. He kind of wished I would have played baseball. Uh, I was pretty good through my teenage years. One of the better pitchers in the state of Alaska I was clocked at 90 years or 90 miles an hour when I was 16. Um, so it was just one of those things that it fell into my lap with bowling. Um, I got cut from the high school uh, baseball team because I was going to miss a a baseball game, uh, bowling a youth bowling event when I was 13. And I said, okay, bowling is the path I'm going to choose now. And uh, going to Wichita State really helped me uh, perform at a higher level, uh, changed my game quite a bit, Uh, met some amazing contacts and coaches through the years, and um, just kind of propelled my career through Wichita State. Did they change your game quite a bit? Oh, God, yeah. Um, when I first got there, my entire back was parallel to the ground. Uh, I was, you know, high back swing, <laughs> up as high as you could pull up, uh, trying to force it. Um, I remember uh, my first couple one-on-one lessons with Mark Lewis, uh, with Coach Mark Lewis. Uh, I would yell at him, like, or he would yell at me, like, why aren't you going to listen? And I was just so hard-headed and, and stubborn. I was like, I'm doing it just fine. Haven't you seen my career? And, uh, he just kind of joked and laughed, um, you know, butted heads with teammates because I had a lot of success as a junior player, but I had no idea about the team level and the team game. And, uh, it took me a long time to figure out being a team player was a lot better off. Yeah, I agree, man. Some of my best memories were from being in college and experiencing those those times with other people. It's not so like cutthroat, like oh I have to beat everybody here. It's more so like oh I got to lift my teammates and be a positive inspiration. And like when things do go well, you have people that feel the same feeling as you. Yeah, definitely. College was was amazing in that in that regard. Yeah, I mean I had no problem um, 
you know, listening and, and giving advice or taking advice. It was just, I always wanted the ball. Uh, you watch some of the movies where champions have been champions for so long and uh, winners want the ball in their hand. And that was one of the things that was tough for me, uh, not having the ball in hand when I needed it the most. Um, and it just, it got better as time moved on. But um, did it, you, it was, did you have ball in hand immediately? Did they, did they no, it took, it took a few years. I got to be anchor a little bit through my sophomore year. Um, mostly my junior year is kind of when I took over, I say, as the anchor position where they trusted me to be in that position. Uh, and then my senior year, of course. But uh, my first couple of years, it was Nathan Burke, Nick Vaughn, Bo McVeigh, those guys that uh, had ball in hand and was our leaders on the bottom of the lineup. Were there ever – you mentioned you wanting ball in hand – were there ever moments where you had ball in hand and you failed? Oh, many, many times. Um, you know, the one thing you learn from other players in other sports is you got to learn from failure. And uh, the more times you put your opportunity in that uh, chance to succeed, you're going to come through and have some success. So, uh, yeah, many times. But when it came down to when it mattered, I felt like my uh, success rate was pretty high in college. So you seem like a guy that doesn't seem to let the negative things affect you a whole lot. And that's that's kind of hard to do, man. Like like you said, you got to focus on the positives. And so when you have ball in hand and you and you don't do it correctly, it can be easy to focus on that. And so the next time you have ball in hand, it's easy to think about that last time. How do you go about if someone watching this right now struggles with that? How how have you went about that focusing on the positive and not so much the negative uh i mean it's so hard to just get caught up in the moment and um think about the bad things and the shot for shot and everything like that but think about the things that you can control in the future and uh people that are positive normally have a, a really good success in their lifestyle uh, their family their career and everything else uh, the ones that are negative and the ones that just keep talking bad about things are the ones that really struggle in life. It seems like, and are always looking for someone else's to complain about it. Um, so, uh, it's, I do it myself. Um, I'm not very negative in public. Uh, I've got an unbelievable support system with my wife, uh, Sarah, uh, my ball reps, uh, Chuck and John and everybody at Brunswick. I'm able to, to vent pretty good there, uh, to Billy and just, and get my frustrations out. Uh, and even my parents through the years. So uh, they always kind of say, hey, look at the other side of the tunnel and see how good it is and what you've got and uh, everything else. That's something I uh, I was actually having a conversation yesterday with someone. And I was talking about how, oh, I was giving a lesson to a junior bowler. And he's a he's a kid that likes to kind of like use his emotions. Like when he doesn't strike, he you can see him being frustrated and, you know, he just ha has a hard time really controlling his emotions. And I was like that too when I was a kid. And I'm just now starting to kind of like mature out of that. But um, when you bowl, it's easy to kind of get so wrapped up in, in what you're thinking about and what you're doing and all the things you need to do and you, this expectation that you have uh, to succeed. And when it's not going well, you're so consumed in, in the result that it's hard to actually – realize that there's life outside of this situation that you're in and so it's kind of funny that you say that you know um a successful life because people who are successful at bowling also treat their life um and become successful in their own lives with whatever that is it doesn't necessarily even have to be money it can just be happiness like you have a wonderful wife that you you like to spend time around or a kid or your parents are great or there are just things about your life that are that are good and in terms of success, you have a successful life, which then turns around into being a successful bowling career. They definitely go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm very, very happy with the lifestyle that I have, uh, the family I have, the, the career that I have. Um, just so, so thankful uh, of everything that has been given to me. Um, yes, I've worked quite hard for a lot of things, but um, for so many years I've been given so many great opportunities to represent amazing companies like Brunswick and high five and vice and um, now Genesis and mongoose over the last couple of years. And 
those are given to you, those contracts. Yes, you earn a little bit of it, but uh, they they give you the opportunity to represent them because they feel like you're going to be a good ambassador for the game, a good ambassador for their company, promote them the right way. And, uh, you know, you have to do the good things on and off the lanes uh, to get those opportunities. People ask all the time, hey, I want a contract. Uh, what does it take? And, well, yeah, it takes winning and, and staying loyal for so long, but there's so many more other things that matter uh, when companies start looking for people to represent them. So uh, I think about my career quite a bit and if it ended today or tomorrow, would I be okay with that? And uh, the answer would be yes, absolutely. So um, is there things that I still want? For sure. There's always dreams and goals and aspirations to look forward to, but uh, yeah, for sure. Have you, could you imagine having like a normal job? <laughs> uh, not at all. <laughs> we were talking before we went on the air about, um, you know, kids and my and my wife and stuff. You know, she works full time, being a, a full time mother, and uh, you know, thinking we have a second one on the way. I can only imagine now she's going to be doing two full time mother jobs. Uh, I just don't understand how women do it, uh, being a, a mother first of all, but. You know, having to get up at seven every morning and be at work at eight and leave at five, it would just, I'd get bored doing the same thing over and over. Oh, I know. I, I, dude, I, I struggle with that too. I don't make a, I haven't made a ton of money bowling, but I've been able to be self-sufficient. And it's actually, it's actually a lot of work because first of all, you have to have your game in the right place because if, if you don't, you know, the, the bowlers around you are good enough to where you're, you're not going to have a whole lot of success. You got to drill bowling balls. You got to make sure you're like your relationships with your companies are fine. You got to do ball clinics like you do a lot. There's just, there's kind of a lot that goes into to being a bowler outside of just really just throwing a bowling ball and knocking down pins. There's, there's more to it. Absolutely. I mean, I'm on the road 200 to 230 days a year. Yeah, that's a big one whether it's tournaments, uh, Brunswick camps, exhibitions, uh, all over the world. So, I mean, just thinking about the next couple of months coming up, uh, I'm going to be home quite a bit, but September, October, I'm going to be gone two weeks in Europe, a couple of days home, two weeks in Asia, a couple of days home, and then two weeks in the Midwest for the PBA fall swing and, and U.S. Open. So uh, the second and third month of my second child's life, I'm going to be home 10 days, maybe two weeks. So very, very stressful uh, to be away from home for so long. Uh, but my, my wife uh, thankfully understands why I'm gone. And eventually I hope my kids are the same way. They understand why I sacrifice what I do to be gone. Um, so throughout your career, have you struggled with that being gone so much? Absolutely. Especially the first couple of years. Uh, now that social media and, and the phones, these beautiful things that I don't ever get off of, um, which my wife hates. None of us do. It's nice to get away from them, but at the same time, it's so nice to, to have them because I can call home anytime I want and uh, say, hey, how's the kids doing? And there's this really cool app. Um, give a little, little promotional tool to this company that maybe they'll jump on board soon. But Marco Polo does this video app uh, that's really cool. And uh, my wife will take pictures and videos of my daughter, Kaylee, and send them to me all the time instead of WhatsApp or anything else. So when I've, I've spoken to Chuck Gardner a couple of times, and if for those who don't know who Chuck Gardner is, Chuck Gardner is the, well, he was the PBA tour ball rep for Brunswick and obviously has a really close relationship with you, but now it's becoming John Van Hees. And is Gardner retiring or is he just getting a position no not at all he's still going to be bouncing around he's actually with john currently with the women down in florida um we've hired john to be a full-time tour rep for the women chuck will uh, partake you know at the majors and you know the first couple weeks to get them started but chuck's still with us um not sure he's going to make it this weekend coming up for the extra frame event that i'm hosting but He's still going to be around quite a bit. You know, the, the PBA 2019 season will be here before we know it. Uh, we were just uh, talking about the schedule the other day and who he's going to need out there for help uh, throughout the seven, eight-week stretch that we have being on the road. Well, I, I spoke to him 
a couple times, one in, in particular, and he mentioned to me that you were a very big part of not necessarily Brunswick's success, but like a lot of stuff that Brunswick does, the clinics, um, a lot of the traveling, you book a lot of hotel rooms, like a lot of the stuff that Brunswick does on like the professional PBA tour level, you're in charge of slash like a part of slash like um, keeping track of a lot of it. Um, so if, if somebody was to want to bowl for a living, what advice would you have for them um, to do so? Because it's, it's more than just throwing the ball down the lane. And I think you're a perfect example to be able to talk about some of the things you do um, to be valuable for a company. Well, like I mentioned just a minute ago is one, just being loyal. Uh, you know, you're an up and coming kid from college or just getting your feet wet on the regional level, you know, stick to one or two companies, um, promote them when you have success, don't throw the other one under the bus at any time. Um, you know, be friendly, be encouraging, um, listen quite a bit, uh, more than, uh, speak your mind, um, or tell them how good you are. Uh, I remember being that kid, uh, almost 20 years ago now to the day, <laughs> uh, telling, uh, telling people all the time, Oh, I'm so good. I have this many 300s and I've shot 800 and I average 230. Well, that's great. Uh, so do these guys, <laughs> <You know? laughs> right? Uh, 30 years old, 20 years old, 50 years old, they've all had success. So, um, the thing with Brunswick, you know, I've been with them 16 years now. Uh, we're in my 16th year. It's been an unbelievable ride, and I, I see 16 more years coming in my future. Um, they've always treated me like family, um, always had a lot of respect. Anytime there's been any beef, we've been able to uh, sit down in the room and talk to each other one-on-one, look each other in the eyes, and say, hey, this is my issues, and and we figure it out as a team and as a, as a group. Um uh, there's always going to be time where you hear some hearsay stuff and the rumors and the friction. And uh, we've seen that so many times through the years and we've always been able to uh, brush off one shoulder and start over. Um, just for instance, we just had a, a great meeting the other day at Bowl Expo with some of the powers that be ahead of me uh, on, the, on the chain there at Brunswick and figure out how to make the, the Brunswick pro staff even better for years to come. Um, as a professional player, your mindset is always one thing, and that's bowling. Uh, you don't know the ins and outs of what goes on in the day-to-day operations. And the one thing that we have at Brunswick that nobody else has um, is we have lane machines, and we have lanes, and we have oils, and we have bowling balls, and we have shoes, and we have pins, and uh, we do it all. You know, all these other companies just yeah. make balls and some bags and stuff. So uh, I've always been pushed in one direction and that is to bowl. So now um, learning some more of the other ins and outs is the philosophies of our companies have changed through the years. I've had multiple bosses um, through the years, uh, whether there have been retirements or uh, promotions or changing positions in the industry. So under, you know, and going from a marketing guy to, a business guy, your philosophy is going to change. Marketers love to spend money. Um, business people, they don't. Yeah, like to make money. <laughs> uh, and so it's been very tough for me recently, just because of some shape we've had. And I, I'm a, I'm not a marketer, so to say, but I want to spend money uh, because I, I like to take the risk um, and see the reward at the other side of the, the other side of the tunnel. So. Um, and we've taken many, many risks uh, through my years, and they've taken many risks on me. I mean, 16 years with me, I can't believe they didn't let me go after 16 minutes. And so uh, I've been blessed. It's, uh, it's been so much fun to, to be a part of a company that has treated me fairly and honestly through the years. Um, but going back to what you asked, you know, how do you ask these kids to, to want to be loyal nowadays when they feel like they're entitled to everything? Um, right. Really, really tough for me to to – to understand because I, I never felt entitled to anything as a kid. Uh, I felt like I had to earn it through the, you know, hard work and practice, but I also eventually something would fall on my lap and it did. Um, how long did it take you to start becoming part of the company? So the first years you signed with Brunswick, you were probably just like throwing bowl ball, try and win. 
Um, you probably didn't have a whole lot of relationships with a whole lot of people or good relationships. How long did it take you to really start to get involved more with the company? Well, it's probably took until my third or fourth year on the PBA national tour. Uh, I signed as a college player at Wichita state. Um, I don't suggest that to anybody now that <laughs> it's happened. Uh, but it was very, uh, why, why? Yeah. The, there's been too many instances, kind of like the, the title nine, and the money and the, the distractions, uh, college teammates get upset. You, know, you get more bowling balls than they do. Uh, you can call an order anytime you want. College programs have unbelievable relationships with all four manufacturers. They should be supporting the industry, not just one company. Uh, I have no problem with companies supporting college programs. Uh, Brunswick supported Wichita State for many, many years. Uh, but having just one or two guys on a staff and then their college is with another program, there's just a conflict of interest. So, um, I, I have seen some stuff like that where um, people like the, the college is sponsored by a company, but a person bowling for the college is sponsored by another company. Yeah, I it's just, that was kind of weird. It's to me, it's just not good. So, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, yeah. They're going to keep doing it for many years to go, and it's something I can't control. So, oh, well. I think that's something we're seeing more and more of is the younger generation is, you know, 15 and 16-year-olds are now competing on tour. And it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, and that's something I've never really agreed with either. Um and it's, it's pretty easy to figure out who that person is. And his name's Trey Ford. And his kids now want a regional. Um, but he's been doing it for so long. Yeah, he's been doing it since he was like 12. Yeah, so now I don't mind him being out there because now he's 18 years old. But I would have rather seen him um, you know, go to school and focus on his school and education and, and everything else and enjoy life a little bit. Uh, I think sometimes these kids our younger players uh, miss the, the fun part of life. Um, you know? Yeah, definitely. And it, the tough thing for us is we're not like a LeBron James where you can go sign a multi-million dollar contract, get hurt, never play again and be okay for the rest of your life. Uh, if this Trey Ford kid goes and gets hurt, where, what's he fall back on? Right. Uh, I don't know his family history. It's none of my business. But maybe they've got money. Maybe they don't. But now you have to start all over as an adult or a young adult and, uh, and battle through some things. So it's really tough. So now he's been okay. But, um, if any, I tell people all the time, I could get in a car accident tomorrow and never be able to bowl again. I at least have a degree. I know our industry. Um, I could fall out of our industry completely. And because of my degree, I could get a job pretty easily. Trey Ford is, a. Uh... <clears throat> It's it's not so bad now, and it, I guess it wasn't ever so bad with him bowling the tour events because he he wasn't ever really like terrible. He always like was able to put up maybe a couple decent scores, um, and especially now he's become a really good bowler and a, and a great kid too. But maybe that's not necessarily the case with all the people that could potentially do it. There may be a family out there with buku money where they want to enter their kid, 12-year-old kid, into a PBA event, and the kid averages maybe 150. Well, that's a good experience for the kid, but that kind of devalues the product of the PBA. Correct. So even, though, even though Trey Ford didn't necessarily do that because he was always decent, um, it, the possibility of having a kid compete that shouldn't be competing is definitely out there with the structure in place. Yeah, I mean, you look at Michelle Wee in golf, you know, she only got to play so many events, and Tiger as a kid only got to play so many events. So they weren't playing every single week. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so I want to talk about something. Um, I'm not sure we see anything like this anymore, but in, in 2007 and 2008, uh, you won the Masters? Correct. In Miller Park. Yeah. How was that? Uh, to me, it was like a life dream come true because I got to play like baseball and bowl. To <laughs> uh, and back in 2007, when I was able to win the Masters beating Steve Barrows, which realistically deserved the title uh, just as much as I did. He bowled like 804 or 813 on the TV show. Um but, uh, yeah, just a surreal moment. And since then, I've been so lucky to bowl in so many uh, arena settings, whether it's outside, 
um, other TSCs and, you know, Vegas uh, World Series of Bowling setups, but nothing like being in a ballpark uh, with dad and, and Sarah at the time was my girlfriend um, and enjoying a moment that I'll never forget. Well, you walked. I didn't. I didn't even think about that. Actually, you walked into Miller Park, being the person that people are there to see. Not necessarily the person, but you were there. It's almost like you were a ball player. Like you walked in. Correct. You walked into the park, being the person that's competing. Correct. Yeah, you're walking in as the professional athlete. Um, you know, our locker room was the uh, the locker room of the you know visiting team. You know, all our bowling balls are in a little stall, and we got to hang our shirts up. And really. I can hang out. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Dude, is that is that your best experience? Is that is that better um, than any other television show you've been on? I mean, the first one's hard to pass. Uh, the first one where I won as a TQR player, uh, Dad and Uncle Steve in the crowd, you know, making multiple washouts and two ten combinations and and forcing my opponent to double to win. And thankfully, Mike Devaney didn't because if he did, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So. Um, yeah, yeah, that one and, and the Masters are two of the biggest highlights of my career. The TSC, uh, of course, and then the 300s out on top of that. So, uh, the first telecast, you well, your first three telecasts you won or something like that, right? You didn't lose on TV for a while? Yeah, I didn't lose my first four. I was 8-0 on television. Um, <laughs> I was uh, to Norm Duke in Wichita, Kansas at the PBA World Championships. That's silly, man. Yeah, it's it, it's good and bad. I mean, losing the norm sucked because I could have broke a record that day. I uh, was in Wichita, Kansas, so I was at home. would have been nice to win at home, win my second major. Uh, unfortunately, a 7-10 split and a solid nine kind of cost my future. Um, was that your rookie season, the first telecast you made? Correct. Wow. That's pretty cool, man. Was that – did you expect that to happen or nah. – I expected it to happen if I was an exempt player at the time. I figured that I would win enough matches to basically get lucky enough to make a show. Uh, but making it through the TQR, I mean, I had so many close calls. Uh, if you go back to my rookie year, I was the runner up through the TQR like six or seven times. Um, half of those times, I bowled 170 or 80 the last game to miss out. Uh, lost in a roll off once. Um, so, talk about disappointment. Uh, it happened quite a bit. Um, so to finally make it through the week prior in Atlanta, I got to match play or just out of match play. It was fun. But then uh, everything fell into place in, place in the West Virginia for some reason. West Virginia. That's where the event was? Yes, sir. Parker's West Virginia. Really? Was there a big crowd? Oh, the place was packed. Uh, Valentine's week. Um Unbelievable facility the following year. Mike Miniman won. Uh, I was able to make match play, not be able to defend. But uh, I wouldn't be disappointed if uh, that place ever got put back on the map for a PBA tour stop. Are the shows any different now than they were 10 years ago? Absolutely. Uh, you know, just the, the atmosphere has changed a little bit. Uh, I kind of like what Tom and the PBA has done recently with trying to bring back the old school put as many people in the building as possible. Uh, not only our sport, but other sports have been trying to put them in like arenas and feel like they're packed. Um, I just want people to have a good time. Yeah. Uh, scream and holler all they want. Uh, it probably would help my distraction in my head from being all over the place. But, uh, you know, the lighting's different. Um, the people that show up are different. Uh, would you the say they're not, they're not as into it? Just, uh, I think they are afraid to be into it. You know, I want them to be into the show and yelling and screaming. Um, I just want to see some other things happen through our events. You know, my, my first year when we made the show on Saturday, we were required to show up during the pro-am and sign autographs and dress appropriately and take pictures. And, and I want to see that start happening again, where, when they walk in, they know who made the show and basically put them on a pedestal because they've had a great week. Um, so, and uh, we started doing more of that recently, and I like where we're going. I watched a while back the show where you, I don't think you're on tour yet, but I think it was one of Barnes's earlier shows where he faced Rudy Casamikas. Uh-huh. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah. I, I think it was Barnes's first title. 
It was. He struck to win and was wearing the flag shirt in the arena setting. And Dude, the, it looked unreal. Barnes would go shoot a 10-pin, and then everybody would, like, stand up and cheer just because he had a spare. It's yeah. like, wow, that atmosphere is crazy. It changes the whole dynamic of, like, the feel with the bowler and – like I haven't I haven't been on TV to experience it yet, but you can just tell by watching it. Like, there's a whole different atmosphere going on when the crowd's like that compared to like when it's a smaller, um, less rowdy crowd. Yeah, and they were giving each other the business throughout the show as well. Yeah, yeah, 1999 flagship open. Correct. Yeah, that's that's crazy how that. I don't know. It's just crazy how it's evolved and how, I guess, how successful bowling was in the 90s. It was huge. And that's when I grew up. You know, you're a little older than me, but that's that's what I grew up watching like that era. And I guess how I guess I was watching the most and I was most into it probably when you first went on tour. I was really captivated by your story of like, you know, being in the TQR and then winning from the TQR, showing people it was possible and then going 4-0 on TV or whatever. Yeah, people didn't think it was possible to make it through a TQR and get to a match play and win and then have success after that. Because there has been some guys that uh, went through the TQR and won, and now they're not on tour anymore. Who, so Who? Who has done it? Do you know? I want to say it was myself. Uh, I want to say Mike Miniman made it through the TQR uh, the following year. It was kind of interesting, back-to-back years. Um, oh, wow. Rhino Page did it. Rhino, yeah, he did. I think of a few others, but it hadn't been a whole lot through the years. You know, I was the first through the regeneration of the tour. It had happened many years prior, but uh, it was definitely really hard to do. I used to, I remember looking at the standings or just watching the PBA every week. That's that's one thing that it was back in the day was it was <laughs> consistent. And so I knew exactly every week, every Wednesday or Thursday, whatever day it started, that qualifying was going on. It was almost every week. So every Wednesday after school, I would come home and watch like the qualifying or the live scoring or whatever. And I, I used to remember thinking like these people would make it through the TQR and then they would go into the real tournament and they would always be kind of like toward the bottom. It was rare you saw someone make it through the TQR and actually like be up in the standings. I used to think like, man, you can bowl good in the TQR. And then every week, majority of the people in the, from the TQR are in the bottom half of the field in the actual qualifying. And I used to think, what changed? Yeah, and then I got sure. enough to, to bowl on tour, and I'm like, oh, it's actually a lot harder than it, than it looks. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they're almost like starstruck kind of thing, even though they hang out with them and travel with them and everything else. It's uh, it's a surreal moment to, to stand on the approach next to Weber and oh, Duke yeah. Barnes and, and Parker and and Tommy and uh, nowadays uh, guys like Belmo and Bill and uh, EJ and Marshall, the younger crowd and the rev rates. Um, it's a surreal moment for sure. And the way the lanes break down is completely different too, just with the higher rev rate. Higher rev rates, the two handers, the urethane, uh, the amount of oil, uh, everything's different. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh it's crazy, man. Bowling on tour is, is difficult, but it's definitely... Is it your favorite thing to do? Do you love bowling on tour? Is that your favorite? I think my favorite thing about bowling on tour is actually the travel and the places I've been able to go to, uh, the, the relationships that I've met and created, um, the foods that I've tried and not tried and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, I would love to just to stay home and be able to bowl, at, you know, be a full-time coach at home, but, um, you know... I can't see myself ever having a job nine to five. I just, I don't think I'll be able to do it. Yeah. I think I, I struggle with it too. It's not so much like having a job nine to five for me. It's just, I don't want to be like a lot of, I'm watching my dad go through it right now. He's working for time Warner cable and they, and they treat him so bad. He's given that company so, so many of his years and, and they're so money hungry and they're so greedy that they just don't care about his life. They care about the numbers he produces and, I just hate that mentality about it. And so I just, I wouldn't mind having a real job, but I just, I want to end up in the correct spot. I think that's the most important thing for me. Yeah. No, my dad ran a professional uh, mortgage company, management company, you know, real estate basically for 30 years uh, in Alaska and then retired and came down here. Uh, Really? Yeah. I'm grateful that him and my mother have retired finally, but now my dad's working at the bowling center part-time where I practice. So it's nice to be able to see him every day uh, when I am home. And, but uh, they basically 
I think to be able to do it, you have to own your own company. I don't yeah. think you can work for someone else and feel happy after it's over with. Right. So I was looking at the the stats and I went through your years and the PBA website said that in 2012 and 2013, you made $248,000. I went through and looked at the, the, the list of tournaments you bowled and it only added up to 116. But there was only, it said you bowled 30 events and there was only like 19 on the thing. So you made $248,000 in 2012 and 2013. Is that correct? Yeah, well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's one of those, that was in the transition period of including the World Bowling Tour into our earnings um, and counting them as titles and, and everything else. So I was that was the year I won in Kuwait, the year I won in Thailand, uh, which was, I don't know, sixty or $70,000. So there's, there's a big chunk of it real quick. <laughs> And uh, some other events that I had a lot of success in. It all you got to remember uh, all the special events that we did with the Six Flags, uh, the team shootouts, Chris Paul's. Those numbers get added into our earnings as well. So uh, that was a really good year, and I could I can use that again if you want to just <laughs> find a way for me to to make that kind of money. Yeah, it, it'll be the uh, the good juju uh, podcast. Thing. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. That means I'm gonna win this weekend. I, my wife would like that. I could. Baby needs new shoes. I need you, some dude, if you win this weekend, you know how much flack you're going to catch? I don't care. I can see it now. Oh, Rash, practice on the patterns and all this stuff. People just people oh. just don't get it, man. Like, you could practice on the patterns all you want, man. It's like It doesn't really do a whole lot because they play different day-to-day, lane-to-lane, like nothing silly. Yeah, I can tell you right now, I've practiced on the pattern four days in a row. Uh <laughs> on a Kegel machine on four different pairs and every day they've played different. Yeah. Uh, out of the 20 bowling balls I have in the facility, um, not one has looked consistent day to day. And it's been unbelievable. So uh, after this podcast is over, I'll be heading to the bowling center again and preparing some bowling balls and um, very lucky that Brunswick is a huge sponsor of this event. Our Brunswick Envoy machine just, uh, arrived yesterday uh, I'll be helping our lane machine uncrate it and uh, we'll be running patterns the next couple of days as well just to make sure the machine is ready so. so you've been practicing on kegel patterns and you're laying them out with Brunswick patterns yeah the actual so, yeah so yeah not even gonna be close gonna... and it's like you can practice all day and be like well this ball looked good after about 30 minutes of play and then you take that into the tournament and the next pair you follow Simonson throwing like a 500 grip ball and you're like Oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be yelling at him and screaming at him, hey, you're not playing the lanes right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so an- another thing, uh, you won an SB. I did. Uh, I don't know how, but I, I did. Wh- who else was Who else was up for an SB? That year was myself, uh, Mike Fagan, and Jason Belmonte. And you won. I think it had a, a lot to do with uh, I was player of the year that year, uh, made pretty much more shows than anybody, made a lot of money, a lot of match plays, and uh, I have a great support system. Um, all of my sponsors helped promote it. Uh, I promoted it. I mean, realistically, we're basically promoting ourselves. Um, so we're trying to win that SB. And for instance, for the four individuals that just got selected, you know, Belmo, Jesper, Rhino and Smallwood, more than likely Belmo's going to win because it's a name that people that vote day in and day out, um, they've seen that name many times. So when I won that year, they had seen my name a lot um, on television or on you know, news reports or whatever the case was, so they were, they were familiar with that name. Um, so the, it's just a popularity contest for an SB, right? Absolutely. It has really nothing to do. So the fact that you won Player of the Year has nothing to do with it. Got you into the qualification for the SB, but the actual voting was just is just a popularity contest. Correct. I mean, it literally was. Hey, have you voted for this person? Um, have you seen this person? Whatever the case is. And who voted? Who votes? Anybody that goes to the page. So 
I'm actually trying to look for it on my uh, on my phone here. Uh, basically, vote for your best person. Huh. So in the world. Yeah. Doesn't matter. As long as you can go to ESPN.com slash ESPYs, uh, NHL player, driver, NBA, soccer, football, baseball, basketball, fighter, golfer, um, and you can vote every day on every device that you have. So, you know, here you go. Best bowler. Let's see if I can. Did you have your entire family vote? <laughs> oh, my, my vote, my family, my friends. Shoot, my ex-girlfriend might have voted. Who knows? <laughs> That's um, what I would do. <laughs> see if we got that. Let's see if we can. Kind of hard to see. I can't see it. It's like not clear. Oh, we're going to let you know. Uh, oh, okay. Tom Smallwood. Voted for Small. So all four of those people get to go to the ESPYs? If they want. Now, it's one of those things years ago they used to help pay for some expenses, but it's an expensive uh, trip. You know, it's not one of those, hey, they're going to fly you out in first class and put you up in a nice hotel and wine and dine you. It's on your dime to, uh, to do this. So, How was the experience outside of just winning? Oh, dude, it was unbelievable. Did you meet a lot of people? I met so many people. Like uh, Thank Patrick, uh, Tim Tebow, Eli Manning, uh, Darius Thomas. I mean, they were all there. So, um, what well, what vibe did you get? Were these people like your idols that you wanted to, to meet, or you know, maybe they're not their idols, but they're obviously very popular sports figures. Are they really down to earth? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't call them an idol. I would say more of we're kind of jealous of the lifestyles sure. they live. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not sure if I'm actually really jealous of some of the lifestyles they live. You know, the fame, uh, the constant bickering, people wanting your money, wanting just to be around you because of it. Um, I think we're jealous of the the money that they make that we probably deserve to make more than anything. Did you give a speech? Oh, yeah, I wish. <laughs> they didn't let you give a speech? Nah, nah, not enough. Dude! So, so what, you... Um... So the when they announce the best bowler, it's at the beginning before the actual broadcast starts? <laughs> no, not at all. So through the ESPYs, it's about a three- or four-hour show. Um, you know, they have all kinds of things going on, but uh, our sport was actually announced during a commercial break. Uh, they showed the highlight of me winning the TSC and a picture with the trophy, and that was it. So uh, at least we're recognized in front of all the, the big names and peers that were there. Um, you go in the back room later to take pictures with the SB and, and hold it and everything else. So, uh, and all the other SB winners, and then they have all kinds of parties prior to the week and into the week. So, so they, so you sit there in your seat, they say best bowler winner, Sean Rash, and then you just continue to sit there. Correct. Man. Yeah. You, it, it'd be cool if, uh, they would announce your name and you go walk it down the aisle and, and say, Hey, I'm here. Uh, come join us one day and thanks for what you do, but <laughs> maybe one day, maybe, uh, maybe Fox will get us there. Maybe you never know, but you got to remember the SPs is more of an ESPN uh, entity. So, Oh yeah. Yeah. Might not be back involved. <laughs> um, so I want to ask, what are your top five bowling moments? And they can be anything. They can be any moment you one you saw, one you remember when you were a kid, your own personal moments. Oh man, those are some tough ones, but it would probably start with uh a junior player uh bowling in the Coca Cola National Championships representing the state of Alaska. That was pretty cool. Where was that at? Well, I was lucky enough to do it four times in a five year stretch. So I went to Memphis, Columbus. Uh, you won four or five years in a row? Yeah, I won three years, lost, and then won another Vegas for the state of Alaska. So I traveled to the lower 48 four different times. So This random kid from Alaska? Just, I don't Beat know. I got on everybody? Well, I tried. <laughs> um, you know, bowling at Wichita State and winning a college championship in 2013, or 2013, 2003 was really cool. 
Uh, same year, Derek Sapp and I both won the, uh, the doubles at the USBCs. Um, Derek had bowled 857 that year, so it was pretty good. Derek Ov? Derek Sapp. Derek Sapp, wow. Derek Sapp. Um, winning my first title, I'll never forget that, of course. Um, the major, the 300s, everything uh, incorporated with that. Uh, bowling for Team USA, representing that country, or our country, uh, uh, and uh, overseas and hearing your country song play when you win a medal uh, is very special. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest things though, is just the opportunity to give back through all the events that I've done through the years, the clinics and the speeches, uh, and the appearances and everything else. Those are the, some of the things that really kind of stick out now being a little bit older, um, and being respected and, and, uh, people calling your idol and, and mentors and stuff like that. Those are, those are the ones that really touch home. Is it weird to you that you've become a person that like people look up to and want to be? Yeah, because it makes you feel like uh, you're old, uh, <laughs> um, which is okay. I mean, I'm 35 now, I'll be 36 in a couple months. Uh, and I understand that there's only so many years left uh, in my prime. So, um, you know, I'm really uh, in awe that people want to be me or inspire to live the life that I have or have the career that I've had. So I've been, it's unbelievable that I have that many people that would think that that's a great career and a great lifestyle. Is that why you do a lot of what you do? Do you do it for, um, do you do a lot of it for the sport? Do you do a lot of it for personal gain? Do you do a lot of it for Brunswick? I do it for the gain of the sport, the start. Um, the sport has given me so much, whether it's Team USA, Brunswick Bowling, uh, bowling for a living on the PBA Tour. Um, I think the ones that are very successful now do it for multiple things. Um, you're trying to keep your name relevant. Um, you're trying to make money for your family. Uh, you're trying to practice and represent the companies that you're a part of the full level that you can. Um but uh, like I said earlier, uh, I didn't earn everything. I was given a lot, and uh, I know that. And uh, I res am truly thankful for that. Um, but through my years, I have earned some of the things I've been given. So uh, unlike other players on our tour that were just kind of given everything to start and never thought they earned it, um, it, it, bother it bothers me quite a bit. So I let that kind of go, but uh, I love what I do right now. And eventually it's going to slow down a little bit. Um, I want to enjoy my family growing up. Uh, I want to be part of their you know, first dance um, recitals and birthday parties and everything else. You know, that's something that I've thought about quite a bit, just being around the PBA tour for like four years now and kind of watching what happens and what goes on. And being a bowler mm -hmm. is, is tough in a lot of ways because, or especially if you like try and do it for a living or if it's like, a particular passion of yours or something because they expect a lot out of you you have to you have to act a certain way you have to kind of um, be professional you don't have to but it's it's best if you are you, know, you have to be a great bowler you have to be able to make money doing it you have to do uh, pro-ams and clinics and you know just recently well not recently I guess but I can remember a conversation coming up uh, where the PBA wanted the players in the extra frame booth more often and like, Oh no, now we got to be great commentators. And it's like, you know, and you gotta, and you gotta support your family and you gotta do all this stuff. And it's just like, and you gotta promote yourself on social media because there's not a whole lot that goes on there in terms of the PBA. And so there's just a lot you gotta, you gotta do and you gotta be decent at. It's, it's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. It's, um, I think one of the biggest things that I've lost respect for in some players is just how they treat other players, uh, tournament directors, um, bowling centers, uh, how they dress and their image and everything else. It, it's frustrating that um, other sports have surpassed us because of the things that they're doing that we should be doing that we used to do all the time. Uh, walking in a bowling center in shorts and flip flops and a hat to me is not professional. Um, drinking during pro-ams, even though I did it as a younger player, I just don't do it anymore. Um, unfortunately, those are 
some things that uh, happen now that uh, sure. we can't control. Uh, we're supposed to uh, as players, but then you're frowned upon when you turn a player in. So um, I can promise you I've definitely turned players in for doing some things they shouldn't be doing. But uh, because I'm trying to think of, you know, if you're sitting there drinking during the pro-am uh, and you're balling with 10 kids and three adults, well, why would anybody want to inspire to be that person? And uh, there's some big names that have done that. So, Well, that's kind of the, that's kind of the difficult part is, is if you really, really care about the game um, and, the, and the direction of the game and the, the condition of the game, then there's going to be times where, like you said, you've turned someone in. Well, they're not going to be happy that you turned them in, so now you've almost created an enemy, when really you're doing it out of good faith. You're, you're doing it because you want the sport to grow, and this so-called person was doing something that doesn't allow the sport to grow. And now, and now they don't like you, and they can tell someone else that maybe you're a dick, and then now that person has bad vibes around you. And it's like... Dude, I was just, you know, I'm, I'm here to try and help the sport grow. It's it's kind of weird how that happens. Yeah, for sure. And just uh, reading some comments here, Zeke just jumped in and said, I'm designing a bowling ball. Yeah. Market. Dude, I'd love to. Uh, I've talked to Chuck about it and Billy um, and Corey and Brian and Bugsy and all these guys for years about, hey, when's the Sean Rash ball? And, uh, you know, the last time we made a ball for somebody was – uh, realistically, the Parker Bone, Mike Albee, and Walter Ray MVPs, uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, I don't know. Um, if they ask me to do it, I'll be forever grateful, and um, maybe one day they will. You know, Johnny Petraglia had one. Oh, my God, how long ago, right? And then they made the remake of it. So um, They will. You know. I hope they do. I think it'd be cool. It'd probably be, uh, I would guess it'd be black and yellow. Uh, <laughs> or yellow and black. Of course maybe. it'd be yellow and black. Do they even, have they ever, ever even made a black and yellow ball? Well, the Versamax, the, uh, there's a couple of balls that have been black and yellow, but, um, well, if uh, if in three years they still haven't made one, we'll start a petition. Hopefully, the podcast will get a million views, and we'll have this following. And we'll just start a we'll just start a petition. Like, look, yeah, we get a million views on this. Uh, <laughs> maybe we'll grab a few more sponsors and whatnot. I, th- I know we've got up to fifty people watching at one point, so that was cool. Yeah, that is cool, man. I've been I've been keeping. Track there's not many people awake at this time, living the. I mean, or they're just bored at work and trying to figure out something to do. Yeah, I haven't. I think this is the first one we've done in the morning. I've done a few at like noon and one, and then I did one the other night last week. I think at like seven p.m. This is kind of the, but instantly, like it immediately went to like twenty viewers. That was cool. Usually it's awesome. like one, two, three, four. Instantly Lowball twenty. Morning. What's that? You're doing. Uh, you're lowballing me. Doing me in the morning, huh? No, that's when you wanted to do it. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I actually, I actually like it because now I'm up. So whenever we wrap it up here, you know, I, I can, I can go and do something. I got time to do stuff. You know, it's not like I'm sleeping until noon and then waking up and then it's four o'clock before you know it. So, yeah. wanna just want I see this other message here from Alan. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that you saw some unprofessional behavior. Uh, you know, you're gonna see it regardless uh, at any event. Unfortunately, definitely at the Masters, a major. Um, I, I will personally say I've been one of those guys that have been bad. Um, we're going to have our bad moments, um, and we're going to have our good moments. So hopefully the ones that, uh, weren't very classy with myself, I truly apologize, but I felt like I was pretty good at the masters. I had a really good run this year, so there was no reason to be upset, but, um, you know, like I said, you're going to see it through, uh, all sports, not just ours and, and hopefully you can look at them at a different way. You've got to remember, this is the one thing I think people struggle with, uh, not just being a bowler, but any sport. We're athletes and we're entertainers. We play a game for a living. We're paid to play. We're paid to uh, put on a show realistically. and Basically paid to put on a show, good or bad. Uh, and unfortunately, you've got people that are going to give you the bad side. And uh, you're going to give a, you're gonna get a lot of people that are going to give you the, the good side of it. Well, when it comes to, I think ultimately every issue that 
happens or exists on tour comes down to money. And so when people aren't getting paid enough money, say you have all these rules and stipulations, and then the financial reward they get um, doesn't meet up with the with the rules and stipulations, they're not going to follow the rules and stipulations because they're not getting paid to do that. So if a person on bowling on tour is only making thirty five, forty thousand dollars a year, they're not really making a lot of money. There's really not a whole lot of reward um, for them to really follow the rules, especially when they don't get punished for it. Now, if they were making like a quarter million dollars and it's like in order for you to make this quarter million dollars, you know, you have to bowl and in order to bowl, you have to follow the rules, then absolutely they'll follow the rules. But, um, you know, if the, if the money situation's not very high and the rules are slacked and, um, not really, uh, forced, uh, then that's, that's what you're going to get. That's what you're going to see. Oh, you're spot on. And it's unfortunate. Um, uh, it, it is what it is. I mean, you're going to have different lifestyles. Some people that have money are bad human beings anyways, but, uh, there are a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of great people in our sport. Uh, the one thing I get slacked for is, um, I treat all of our PBA people uh, with a high, high respect level. Um, Kirk Von Kruger, John Weber, Tom Clark, Janae, Sam, Mary, and anytime I ever get out of, out of line, they pull me aside in private. Um, and I just, I wish more of our players would do that where they would, you know, these people are running a professional organization trying to do they bet, the bet, their best for us as players. And uh, things would change their back. If, uh, if we can start treating the people in charge with some respect and then our, you know, even our players, our, our other players. Man, I agree, dude. It's, it's hard to the, – the people who run the PBA have a hard job to do. Tom Clark has a really hard job to do. Could you imagine, like, his competitors are the NFL and the NBA and, like, these insanely successful uh, institutions – and it's like, yeah. how do you beat that? How do you convince a company that you're just as good or your ratings are going to be just as good? Like That doesn't even seem possible to me. You can't. You know, he's being in some multi-billion dollar companies, even though our industry is a billion dollar industry. Um, these guys are multi-billion companies, travel all over the world, multiple players, huge stars, uh, sponsors and everything. So... What Tom and Kirk and everybody at the PBA has done for the PBA since I've been around, um, I think it's been great. I know there's been some struggles where we haven't had some events or no TV, but honestly, I, I could care less if we're on television because eventually we're going to get put on through YouTube or uh, Flow Bowling now or anything else. So give us events to bowl that creates fans, that creates sponsors, um, creates titles and everything else. And then uh, television will take care of itself because there's so many entities out there to be on television. There are. Uh, like, you can be on Netflix now. Netflix is huge. <laughs> I mean, parents don't even have cable. They have Netflix. I mean, cable I mean, cable is is a dying industry. It's eventually going to get ran to the ground. Live, live streaming is taking over. Yeah, DVDs, uh, DVDs are gone. You know, they're now, or CDs or whatever. And, um, and that was like early 2000s. That was like the greatest thing. It's like, wow, how can you possibly put all this stuff on a little disc? And now it's just like, wait, what's that? It's not even like. Well, I'll show you a little something. I was going through some old files the other day. <laughs> you might not even remember this. Dude, you can't show that, man. People in the chat don't even know what that is. I do. This was. Uh... I got to shred it somehow. I don't know how well anybody can read that because my handwriting is awful. But this was my first year on tour, uh, 2006. This is how I kept track of my expenses. Really? This little, uh, little floppy disk. And I got a couple of them uh, still around. But uh, we got them. I actually, I actually wrote that down. Your first year, you made $55,000. Is that about right? Yeah. Something like that. Were you happy with that? Absolutely. I well, I guess because you won, yeah. Yeah, I won. Uh, when I won, everyone said, hey, are you happy with how you did? I go, absolutely. I just created a income uh, for the next so many years. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, I have a contract now with Brunswick. I'll probably get paid uh, other incentives and, and everything else. So um, 
even if I never made a cut, I was getting you know, 30 grand, 40 grand, whatever it was. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, $55,000 your first year on tour is, um, that's pretty good because not a lot of people, well, it, but it was different. What, what year was that? That was uh, 2005. Yeah, 2005, 2006. I was 15 years old. How old? You were 22, 23? Something like that. Yeah, we'll say 22. Dang, man. That was a long time ago. Yeah, you're making me old. Do you feel like you're a better bowler now than you were, let's say, like seven years ago when you were having a bunch of success? I'm a more mature bowler. I'm not a better bowler because my uh, success is high. So um, I, I know when to take advantage of uh, the opportunity, and I know when I don't have it more than anything um, just because of how different things are. So I'm starting to realize that too. As you start to, like, if you do it enough, kind of go back to that conversation about lane patterns and you being able to practice on them. They never play the same anyway. And eventually you bowl on it enough, like you just bowl on enough patterns where you kind of just start to understand what's what. So if a pattern is playing like this, you've seen it a bunch of times, you kind of have an idea of what to do. And if a pattern is playing like this, you kind of have an idea of what to do. And the more you bowl, the more it just you just become knowledgeable on what to do. And you seem you seem lost a little bit less. And even when you're not bowling good, you understand why you're not bowling good, rather than like maybe when you first started. It's like you went fifty under and you have no idea why. Yeah, now I mean I've always been a big advocate of your balls and tell you what to do and if you need to change and what part of lane you need to play, if you need stronger or weaker stuff. Uh, one thing that my first tour at Rick Benoit always said was I was real good at deciding if a bowling ball was good or bad. And I would throw three or four shots and. Uh, I would keep it in the bag or get rid of it. So, um, for instance, I just drilled a brand new ball through it three or four shots the other day and it thumped and I don't know why it thumped. I don't know if maybe part of the label wasn't sanded down enough or flared too much or whatever the case is, but, um, that bowling ball is already in the trash can. So it's not one of those, Hey, I'm going to keep throwing it and beating my head up trying to make this ball work. So. Yeah, I, I tell I tell my students it, it may be like a, a bit of an exaggeration, but I say if I don't strike with a ball in three shots, I'm putting it away. <laughs> I mean, just because you know, good, like, that's you a know, good ratio. Like, what's that? That's a good ratio. Even though uh, I'm sure yourself, myself, people that are listening, we've started many nights or tournaments where we've thrown six or seven frames without a strike. Yeah, and I mean, even if even if you're not even if it's not the ball and it's you not executing correctly. Then, like, even if it is me, then why am I even? Why am I gonna continue to try and like get the feel of this ball in my hand down? I'm wasting frames. Correct. Right. That's just how I see it. But so if so, let's let's uh let's not talk about bowling anymore for a few minutes. Let's talk about what do you, what are some of your bucket list items? What do you want to do in life? What do you want to um, accomplish? One of the biggest things I want to accomplish is have a great good enough career to where my family can uh, be able to go to school at night or school during the day, have a home at night to sleep under uh, bills paid um, and enjoy their childhood. And, uh, you know, knock on wood here so far, things have been pretty good um, with the second baby on the way. I basically have 18 more years to be able to provide um, for another child. And God willing, we might have a third who knows, but, um, you know, those are the biggest things is just making sure my family is taken care of, um, keeping that close grit, you know, knit, knit of friends, um, friends forever, like Billy Orlikowski and Chuck Gardner and, and Corey and, and Barnes and Parker and a few others uh, that have been friends regardless of the success. Um, you know, those are the things that matter to me more than anything. Who is that the way your dad was? Your parents were? Yeah, dad was always, uh, still is, working way too hard to make sure things are taken care of at home. Uh, you know, his generation, uh, I, I say this all the time, is he'll be 70 in January, but they don't, uh, they hold grudges for a very, very long time. Uh, and it drives me nuts. I'm, I've always been a guy that'll be able to forgive and forget, um, even with other things that have happened in my life. But my dad is really tough with that. I mean, you get on his bad side and that's it. Um, so, um, yeah. Been a protector for so long, I think, that it's just 
back in the day, that's what you had to do, you know? So, um, but yeah, dad was always that guy, make sure things are taken care of at home. Mom was kind of the same way with, uh, the things at home, make sure that, you know, the bed was made and the chores were done and really good, uh, accountant growing, you know, her lifestyle. So that's helped me with, uh, being financially somewhat secure. You know, I, I look at my family, my family's kind of the same way they spend, my mom and dad spend the, every waking moment trying to either provide for their family or try to help their family. Everything they do, their family's first. And it's crazy because I, I spend like every waking hour of my day trying to figure out how to be successful and how to make money and how to do all this stuff. And then my parents don't care about any of that. They just care about their kids being healthy and happy. And it's like, wow, what a totally crazy mindset. But then again, I, you know, I don't have a family. It's everything changes. Once you have your first kid, it's like, Oh, Whoa, this is yeah, a life. I mean, I'd man. love to be able to, to live at home and my parents still pay the bills. The ones that matter, those you know, mortgage payments and car payments and, insurance payments and all that but uh yeah it's tough man it's um it's uh it's really tough and it's, it's one of the reasons why i travel so much and always knocking on the door for sponsors and trying to create uh create some really good open relationships um uh, all around the world well i think you know yeah so maybe you're missing a little bit of you know um, time with your daughter by traveling so much or you know, whatever, whatever downfalls there are about traveling. But in reality, you're actually working your butt off. So it could be a good thing for Kylie, Kaylee, 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 because she, she saw her dad have a work ethic like no other. And that's something that, you know, you want your kid to have is to be able to whatever they want, they need to go out and work for it. And so the fact that she's going to grow up watching you do that. Yeah, you're not at home, but you're trying to provide for her. I think I think that's probably a pretty good lesson for her to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And I've said it many times today and through life's um, career moments that family's first. Um, people asked me if I was going to bowl this event when our second's due, and I said, no chance. Uh, if my wife goes into labor early, uh, I'll skip the Lucy Beno doubles because it's uh, really, really close uh, to it. Um, you know, I'll stay home for a good 10 days before I make my next event. Uh, but my wife has got an unbelievable uh, structure with time and very diligent, and very smart with, uh, with Kaylee so far and keeping our house intact and, and making sure things are okay. Yeah, that's really cool. So who, who has inspired you the most? Oh, it'd be my parents. I mean, just the, they're my heroes, both mom and dad, uh, for obvious, for obvious reasons and different reasons. So, uh, they keep pushing me to, to do the right things um, on and off the lanes. Uh, they've always taught me it doesn't matter if you win, that they're always going to be in my corner. And, and that's one of the things that my wife has done an unbelievable job with as well. Is, um, whether I win or lose, her first question isn't, how much money did you make today? Are, are you happy with your performance? Um, you did your best. We're excited for you to come home. Um, and uh, she's like, that she knows and I've said this many times if you win a trophy the money takes care of itself so um, that's kind of how I've always looked at it outside of your family uh, outside of the family would definitely be some people at Brunswick uh, the first would be Parker Bone he's been a great friend and mentor um, Billy Orlikowski we've worked together now for 16 years uh, Chuck has been a big part of my life for the last decade uh, Rick Benoit um, now the CEO, Corey Dykstra, and I have become really good friends, and he's really taught me a lot about uh, lifestyle and handling the, um, the travel and the work ethics and stuff. So, um, And Chris Barnes, um, you know, we don't talk as much as we used to, but um, Chris has always been a, a mentor, a friend. He basically is one of the first guys to uh, get me on tour, and it's uh, been fun to, uh, to watch his career blossom and, and stay at a high level for so long. Okay, now outside of the industry. Oh, man. Uh, that'd be tough. Um, you know, since my industry, I've been in the industry for so long. Um, I would say some, some high school coaches and parents and, and teachers and whatnot that uh, just been great supporters and great friends. Um, regardless of how I bowl and they follow my career and 
uh, stay in touch with friends. I mean, those those people really truly matter. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cool. I, I can remember I can remember being in high school and I had a calculus teacher, um, and to this day, man, just the things he did, the way he said them, the way he handled himself, the way he handled like punk kids, it stuck with me. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, yeah, that's cool. So, um, what's the worst thing to ever happen to you? <clears throat> Miss a flight? What? <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, just <laughs> you know, you're have bad breaks along the way <laughs> on the bowling lanes, uh, breakdowns, missed flights, uh, arguments, any of that kind of stuff. But um, I've been very lucky, man. Um, I've only had a couple of injuries that have hurt me or set me back a little bit. I've been able to find a way to get through them. Uh, I have amazing homes, uh, an amazing family. I'm very, very blessed and very lucky. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on the podcast is because I know how good of a guy you are and, and, and what values you actually have. And and I uh, I value that a lot, man. I really do. When you, when well, you... I appreciate that. It's, uh, I think that's one of the tough things that people have with my personality uh, is that I speak from the heart too much instead of like thinking through things and then speaking. Uh, for instance, uh, I sent an email to a PVA official the other day, kind of scolding him. And uh, I should have never done that. Um, I, I needed to step back and think of the big picture. And I got that advice from someone else um, after they saw it. And uh, so I immediately, after I'd cooled down, wrote an email as an apology. And uh, did I have to do that? No, not at all. I, I say this um, only because it just happened, but it's happened many times through uh, my career where I've gone off on someone without thinking, what the hell, maybe their best interest is mine and everybody else's. So um, I'm always looking out for my teammates uh, at Brunswick, um, the best interest for our company, all the companies I represent, PBA, the players. Um, yeah, I want to win, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm also very realistic that I'm not going to win every event. I shoe up thinking I'm going to uh, and feel like I can, even if I'm not healthy or practiced enough. But uh, I've always got the sport in its best interest because of what it's done for me. Yeah, I can. The thing about competing is no one likes to lose. So you could be the greatest guy in the world, like the greatest guy in the world. If you're beating everybody consistently, then they're not going to like you just because they don't like to lose. Uh, yeah. they, may, they may like you outside of the bowling alley when they cool off or like, say you beat them, they're gonna, it's going to take them a couple hours to cool off. But in that moment in time, um, yeah, they're not very fond of you. And if you have like a, a personality like yours where it's like, you know, you ride on confidence. I can, I can remember... When you didn't, you did an interview at the World Series of Bowling the year before my first World Series of Bowling. I was still in college, and you made all four shows, or five shows, whatever it was. Made all four cuts, whatever. Like you just dominated, and you did an interview, and you're like, "Well, I ride on confidence, and some people like it, some people don't like it, but that's what I have to do to succeed." Yeah. And when when it's like that, and you're beating people, they're not gonna like you a whole lot, even though you're a great dude they're in the real time. They're not going to like you until maybe a couple hours. After. Yeah, that was a, that was a good uh, couple of weeks. I actually made seven shows just to, to clarify it, but, uh, seven. Yeah. Um, we were actually at bowl expo last week at South point, you know, for two weeks straight, I went to Seattle's best coffee, had a white chocolate mocha and a chocolate croissant every single morning, um, 14 days straight, you know, so <laughs> a little superstitious, I guess, but, uh, how are there seven shows? Well, I made four animal patterns, the world championship pattern, the double show, and something else. I don't know. Dude, you're nuts, man. At that point in time, were you, did you feel like you were the best in the world? Um, yes and no. I mean, because I know I could be beaten at any moment. That's cool. Yeah, and uh, you know, at the same time, um, I feel like if we never had done the arena setting, I might have a couple more player of the years and five or six more titles. Yeah. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully this weekend, um, 
you won't get your next one and I'll get my first one. That would be that would be pretty cool. Well, you're going to have to earn it. I will tell you that. Yeah, if you get second and I win, you can't be mad. Let's just let's yeah. just say that. No, not at all cuz I'll have a great payday. Uh, I'll make the first show for Flow Bowling. Uh, um and I gave it my all, and I was one game away from a title. Yeah, and your family and friends will be there. Let's talk about that real quick before we wrap this up. You're running a tournament this week, and this is your th- second or third year doing it. This will be my second extra frame event that I've ran, uh, third PBA event that I've run. And it's it's kind of a quirky format. Go go through why you chose the format that you did. Well, it's interesting. You know, so the first ever event that I ran for the PBA uh, was back in Wichita, um, a huge regional prior to the world championships. And we used both uh, North Rock lanes and Thunderbird lanes where I practice. We bowled you know, six or eight games at each center. Uh, then we bowled the semis at one. And then we bowled match play at the other. So uh, now this year uh, I'm using some formats that have, of events that I've used throughout the world. Um, the bonus pins for the people you beat on your pair was in Kuwait. Uh, it used to be the final round was the top 15. You bowl five games, uh, get bonus pins for each person you beat. You change pairs. You bowl with different people, and that created the step ladder. So that kind of created the uh, the bonus thing. And also in college, and uh, you used to do that. You'd bowl within two pairs, and you get so many bonus pins. Uh, the reason I do the the bonus pins the way that we're doing it is, uh, I think players, even at a high level, myself included, when we throw fill balls, uh, we get complacent at times. Um, you know, instead of trying to get as many pins as possible, even though you throw a new ball, you're looking for that next reaction and everything else. And so if you need a strike to win an extra 20 pins, um, you're not going to change balls. No, that's big. Uh, 20, 20 bonus pins will add up quickly, especially with 16 games you know, and uh, 360 bonus pins uh, max. The other thing was um, – the bonus pins was the, the middle average player, uh, the amateur that bowls. If they beat an EJ Tackett, Sean Rash, and Dominic Barrett, uh, those are some highlights for them in their career. Oh, definitely. Uh, they can go home and brag about it. You know, right now we have 82 members and 20 non members signed up. We're 102 entries. We're six entries from being full, which I'm ecstatic about. Um, that, uh, that's a big deal to me with uh, with that mindset. Um, and then it goes into Monday? It does. Why'd you do that? A um, couple things. Uh, there's a big amateur event the following weekend uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Um, players love to be able to bowl multiple events in a short span and save some money on travel and expenses. Uh, with the 4th of July being Wednesday, I figured people would have Monday and Tuesday off anyway. And uh, I would like to have as many games as possible. Uh, the, more, the more games, uh, normally the best players get there anyways. They always say the cream rises to the top. But uh, I was kind of looking out for the players' options to, uh, and the people that work. Uh, you know, having two events in one. Uh, other things to do, being in the Chicago area, the Cubs play the Tigers on Tuesday. Uh, so they can go to a baseball game. Uh, Chicago is a beautiful city to, to hang out and, and travel and go see things. So uh, pretty pretty fun uh, place to hang out. It's going to be really interesting because if you make Monday, that's that's not normal territory. That's, a, that's not a weekend day. Uh, we're not used to bowling on Mondays. And there's only going to be how many people that make it to Monday, 24? Well, right now we would actually cut to 25, but I announced it to, I didn't announce yet, but I'll do it live here. But I told Rich Weber, we will cut to 27 no matter what. Um, The cross and the format works out perfect. And uh, we have enough money in our prize fund and entries and sponsors money to pay 27 spots. And uh, so we'll do it that way. Well, I'm I'm kind of a believer that the longer the event goes, the more emotionally invested you are. So if you make mon if you make Monday, that's going to be a lot different than just bowling Saturday, making a cut, and then bowling Sunday because we do that every single weekend. Yeah, well, this- there's so many other things. You know, going back to the format side before we'll talk about more of the event. Um, you know, the top left. If you start on lane one, 
uh, you'll skip a pair to the left. If you're a 1B, you'll skip two pairs to the left. And the same thing with one or 2A and 2B. Uh, for 16 games, um, if the cross works out, in my mind, the way I broke it down, you won't bowl with anybody at the same time um, but one person. So you'll bowl with 62 different people uh, through 16 games. Um, people get tired of following the same person and the same group and the same pair and how they break the lanes down. Uh, but now you get to bowl with everyone and it goes to middle of the road player, uh, the amateurs. Um, hey, I want to bowl with Sean Rash or EJ Tackett or Brad Miller or uh, Dominic Barrett. I've never, yeah. you know, I've seen them bowl. I've been close to them, but now you actually get to bowl with them. Um, so you think about that, you know, 108 entries, 62 people, you're going to bowl two thirds of the field. Uh, I'm ecstatic about that. So, um, I think it'll be very, very challenging and very fun and uh, exciting to see how people uh, play each game. So we have uh, Friday is the practice session, Saturday qualifying, Sunday qualifying, and then cut to the top 27, and then Monday they come back for a certain amount of games, and there's a step ladder. Correct. All three, all three squads have a 39-foot pattern. Why did yep. you choose the same length? Well, so last time uh, we did multiple lengths. Um, we didn't have the PVA truck on hand, so we weren't able to drill some balls. Uh, so giving people an idea of how long the pattern is, it'll give them a better opportunity when they travel with their arsenal. Uh, we do pro shops in the vicinity. We have pro shop on hand. If they wanted to bring balls and drill, they could. But uh, all three patterns, uh, I'll get to practice on them later and tomorrow and, and Friday, uh, should play very different. Um, this is a very tough building already. Uh, the front's hook, they're tight down lane, the gutters don't hook. Uh, so you would think, oh man, that's just gonna make everybody play the track and loft the gutter. That won't be the case. Um, last time we ran chameleon, which was 42 and, and bare and strips. This time we're running uh, chameleon again at 39 feet. Don Carter in, in the U.S. Open, bare, uh, all 39 feet. And uh, you can play the gutter on bare. Uh, Chameleon, you can play anywhere. Uh, and Carter will be very, very challenging, I think. So uh, you're going to see a lot of different uh, styles and play have success. If you look at the step ladder finals from the first time, uh, you had a high rev lefty that just got to the show with one game to go. Um, J.R. Raymond, uh, a unique uh, player that's very good at the gutter and very good at falling back. Uh, Chris Prather, who was just coming into his prime, I think, on you know a name to the PBA, and then Walter Ray, who Walter Ray, yeah. been around forever. So you didn't have one style of play dominate the event, right? I can, dude. I was last year at your event. I was so impressed with Simonelli because the first two patterns didn't really necessarily match up to him. He was just grinding. I can remember listening to him uh, say like, "Ah, well, you know, I'm just get nine, get nine, get nine. And he he was, dude. He was just grinding. Grinding like crazy for for however many games, you know, 15 or whatever. And then you lay out the strips pattern, and then bam, he's in the lead. Yeah, so, and he didn't get in the lead until the vi final game of qualifying. Uh, he bowled 230 or 40 on the high end. Um, people don't remember that, but I do. Uh, but, yeah, it, uh, and it also only took, you know, between 215 and 220 average to make the the step ladder finals and it only took like 206 or seven to make the finals on Monday, you know, Sunday that day. So, um, I want them to be challenging. I love the shot making philosophy. Me too. Shooting's going to matter. Um, you know, you're not just going to throw single pins away when you're, when you're shooting at pins in the 10th frame, you're going to get every pin you can. Right. And then there's also a, a golf outing thir Friday morning with the sponsor. Yeah. So are the sponsor of the event actually going to play with us? Correct. So uh, we've got 18 pros, 19 pros playing with 18 different groups uh, Friday morning. Um, 18 different groups. So each pro is going to have a group of people to play with? Correct. Wow. So we've got, I've got about 25 or six sponsors, and unfortunately uh, seven or eight of them can't make it uh, for the golf outing, but that's for them. Uh, the huge pro am on Friday night, uh, we're pretty much sold out. We've got like six or seven spots left, maybe 10. Um, we get a few buys if we had to, but we're going to try to avoid that. Um, Saturday, the uh, barbecue, 
and uh, band on in the afternoon as soon as we get into bowling. Uh, sponsored by the Aurora uh, CVB. Our pro am on Friday is sponsored by High Five Gear, who's a huge supporter of the PBA and players. Um, and I think the best part of the event is going to be Sunday afternoon after the second round of qualifying. Uh, we're giving a, away a free youth clinic. When I say giving away, but allowing any youth member in the area from ages 7 to 21 uh, to join us for three, four hours on the lanes and get lessons from some of the best players in the world. Wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, I've got eight pros guaranteed to be there, and uh, I'll be asking yourself and many others to uh, to stick around and, and help out um, to enjoy the day. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. Well, I, I, wish, uh, I wish you the best this week, and I'll obviously be there. Um, but I'm really looking forward to it. I, I can remember telling people last year that I, I think my favorite event last year was yours. And it was the. Well, I'm hoping to uh, surpass that. I appreciate you, you saying that, but I hope to uh, surpass what you, ex- you know, ex- excited and expected the first time. But um, there's a lot going on. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's more of an event. There's multiple patterns. There's golf outings. There's pro ams, full pro ams, and then free clinics and. Like I, I just think you have a, a good understanding of what people want to see and what's good for the sport, so that's why I do my best to support it. Well, I appreciate that, and I think one of the things our sport has lost is you, or people have lost in our sport watching is that oh, you just go and watch bowling over and over and over. Um, you go to all these other sporting events, and it's more of uh, you get to to drink beer, of course, and watch the television or watch the game, but. Uh, you can play Keno or gamble on the game, or there's a some sort of contest somewhere in the concourse to uh, to be involved in. And so I want this to be kind of the same thing where the bowling's going on, and then the finals will take care of itself. But uh, there's other things to be a part of that help the event and make it successful. Yeah, well, man, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really um, looking forward to seeing you this weekend. Well, you get to, uh, get some practice in. Make sure you go practice on those three patterns on your lane machine and your facility. And uh, I'm sure they'll play identical when you get <laughs> Yeah, I'll be ready to go. <laughs> You'll either miss the cut by a bunch or make the cut by the bunch and leave because you did that. Yeah, and you can blame it on the practice session. Yeah, exactly, because you knew the beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> well, man, let's – uh. What do you say? Let's wrap it up. We've been doing this for an hour and a half. That's about perfect. I think that's pretty. Well, good. I can't believe it's been that long. I feel like I talked to you for like three minutes. One, so one thing uh, I one thing I love about these is I, I love the the idea of just starting with a with a topic and just going and just being really genuine. Um, that that's that's the way I like enjoy I, I enjoy listening to podcasts that I listen to. Um, not much structure, just two people talking about what they love. Um, and and I've really enjoyed this one. So I want to thank you for for coming on. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I would have rather looked at Kyle all day than yeah, you. Yeah, he's a he's a prettier guy. I appreciate you taking the, to, to interview me, and uh, look forward to seeing you this weekend. Make sure your golf game's ready, and uh, we'll see you in a few days, buddy. Um, before we wrap it up, I do want to say one thing. Kyle and I started a a, a page on Patreon, and Patreon is an outlet for us to create content and potentially get paid for it. So if you, if you haven't checked out Patreon. It's P-A-T-R-E-O-N um, dot com and then go to Brad and Kyle. Uh, we're going to start posting stuff on there. And we actually currently have eight Patreon subscribers and we started about a week ago. So I, I do want to give, I wrote them down. I, I do want to give a shout out real quick to Michael Vineyard, Adam Martinez, my boy Adam Martinez, uh, Ryan Durr, Chris Kitchen, Casey Mattingly, Dave, Mike Esco, and Eric Capizzi. Thank you guys for supporting our Patreon page, man. We, uh, we look forward to putting together some content for you guys. And uh, I don't know, man, between the YouTube page and the Patreon page, hopefully a podcast with Sean Rash, hopefully we can just do our part in uh, growing the sport. So, Well, tell me what it costs. I'll give you a check on Friday. Maybe it'll bounce. It's a, but... it's a dollar a month. You can afford it. All right. Well, you'll have to sign me up because I'm not very good with this computer stuff, right? <laughs> All right, so thank, thank you guys for joining in. Um, I don't know who the next guest is, but sometime next week we'll have another guest. Um, yeah, Sean. I think the next guest should be the champion of the event. Okay, deal. We can make, All right, buddy, see ya. We can make that happen. All right, man, take it easy.